everybody, just you have to follow instructions because it's a school environment. So <laughs> you know what I'm going to do, right? Are you like guys, everybody if everybody has a name tag, then you, if you write your name, but don't put them on, okay? Well, no, 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 no. Actually, everybody should have a name tag. I'm sorry, I'm doing this bad. If everybody has a name tag, I'm going to tell you what I want you to do. You're going to get a name tag, and then you can pass some cards around. And I'm going to tell you about our cards in a minute. But a name tag, if you took a name tag, right, everybody knows this. Hello, my name is? Okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take the, the name tag and put it on your forehead <laughs> and write your name. You guys have been writing your name for a long time, right? It's pretty easy, right, in class, right? We can all write our name. So just write your name. You guys have it? I want the teachers to have it. Okay. Yeah, we need one. Yeah. Teachers. Oh, this will be fun. Do we have some for the teachers? <laughs> where did, oh, where are those names? That's a long name. Oh. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. So what you're going to do is you're just going to write your name. I need some for the teachers. Yeah, you know where I'm going to sign right now. Oh, yeah. We had a bunch of kids. Okay, so all you're going to do, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Just write your name, right? I hope I don't come off the name tag. How come you're not sitting here? Oh. Why? Oh, there we go. Sorry, I'll be back yes, there. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. And I know you guys have pens because, you know, when I was in school, I okay. teachers said, what if you went to work one day and you didn't have a pen? Oh, no, we, we oh, you did it to, oh, you, know, you weren't listening, following. Okay, so you got your names, right? Now take it off. After you write your name up here. On your forehead, you right? And then, so you're writing, you gotta write your name there. Oh, you don't have a pen. Are you a teacher? Yes. You are a teacher. A teacher. I know, that's what they say. What if you go to work and you have a pen? Okay, so we're all doing it. And then you take them off. Okay, I got it. Then you take it off. Perfect. Do I look okay? How is it? Good. Now put them right here. Put them right here, and that's. You have an easy name. Then, now you guys, for all y'all that are dyslexic or dysgraphic, oh now you guys know how to do it. You guys need some, you got it. Oh, you need a pen. A pen. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Miss Amy, Miss Holly, you guys, do you guys have a question? Do you want to ask the, the, the these guys to get these guys going? What's your question, Miss Miss Holly, Miss Amy? You guys want to ask them a question? Wait, wait, wait. wait while you're still doing that, let me ask you a couple questions. Okay, how many people, okay, so you're going to take your name tags, you're going to put them here after you put them on your forehead. Okay, how many people learn by seeing? Just raise your hands. You learn best by seeing. Okay, you learn by seeing. Coincidentally enough, the cameraman learns best by seeing. Go figure. Okay, how many people learn best by hearing? How many people learn best by hearing? Anybody? Okay, he does audio visual too. Okay, how many people learn best by doing? doing people. How many people just don't learn at all? <laughs> okay, so what do we have? It's usually it's about a third, a third, a third. We all learn differently, right? Isn't that, that's what our film's about. All right, Miss Holly, do you have a question? Do you have a question for these guys? Your first question, or can we just ask them what they think, or can I just keep rambling? I can ramble about all kinds of stuff. Well, I was just gonna ask, have you ever had students in your classes that couldn't read, and what did you do to try to help them get through your class? Most of you know I'm a retired teacher. I was a high school math teacher, but I have my master's in special education, and I was fortunate enough to work in a district that really invested in students with special needs. They really did. So on the high school level, if we identified a learning difference, we um, serviced it. We got, had resources, I had, I had math students mainstreamed in my classroom, and those who specifically couldn't read, they had readers. Um, they had IEP programs whereby their testing conditions were modified. Those who had dysgraphia had, had scribes. There were people who moved to that town in Long Island, specifically in Fort Houses there, because they knew that the children would be serviced. So um, I was fortunate in that regard, but even with that, those services, as I said earlier in another session, we have to assess what's going on with every child everywhere. So um, certainly dyslexic children need specific um, um, learning and teaching strategies. But children with emotional trauma, um, we have to identify um, when what I say A does not equal A, when ability does not equal achievement, what got in the way? Was it a teacher that got in the way? 
Was it a, a, a socioeconomic status that got in the way? Was it dyslexia that got in the way? So I have to say, although I taught in a district with a lot of political problems, they, um, they did invest their resources and they addressed the needs of, of young people. And we did it class by class. I did it in my math classroom. I, I, and um, we did it in all the classrooms. I just want to say, there's also probably a reason why these guys are like Teacher of the Year awards. I mean, 20 year veterans, these guys have witnessed a lot of stuff. But the really cool thing is that each one of us in this room has the ability to make a difference somehow, somewhere. And so the knowledge that we know that works, what works, and you said it, you hit it right on the, on the head. If we could take a time elevator, like me, did you guys see the picture of me when I went from kindergarten? That's enough about you guys, let's talk about me. When, <laughs> when, when we were in, when I went from, when I went from being a kindergartner to a, to a high schooler, right? That happens to every student, believe it or not, right? So I just showed it in this thing. But you see, I had like long hair and a and leather jacket. I still have that same leather jacket and I saw long hair. <laughs> but I was like a derelict, right? Now, if you had to teach that kid, how do you unlock that kid? The thing is, take a time elevator, that's why I like what you said, what got in the way of this kid as a reader in first grade, second grade, or third grade? So I, I just I love that. Okay, the question, of how you guys have people who couldn't read, and, and what grades do you guys teach, and how do you work with that? I have middle school and high school, early high school, and um, I guess I didn't really, <laughs> I guess I was in the dark about <laughs> You know, as a teacher, you naturally see that some kids struggle and some kids struggle in some areas and some in other areas. So even though I didn't recognize necessarily a dyslexic child, uh, the strategies that I've used to help kids were for everybody. Things like reading aloud, and I did that because I loved it when people did it for me. And so I really wanted to give kids that opportunity to visualize the story and I do the, you know, characters and all of that. Um, and then they start wanting to do it to some of them, not all of them. Um, we've done a lot of hands-on things because I learn best when I do it. And so instead of reading about things like velocity, water velocity, we went out and made it an aqueduct. And we watched what happened and then what worked. And then I could introduce vocabulary that was pertinent to that activity while we were actually doing the hands-on work. Lots of pictures because I'm a visual and I'm a musician, so I use my music a lot in the classroom. So um, the other thing I learned the other day was I, we do cursive in our school still. Uh, it's an art form. <laughs> and I did not realize until the other day when I was speaking with someone that the cursive actually helps a lot of dyslexic kids. I was doing it because it's quicker it's beautiful, it's in incorporating art into the idea of language and communication as well. And I felt it was easier for kids. I was saying uh, yesterday that when I had second graders in my early years of teaching, I used to collect all of the roll-on deodorants and pop the tops off and fill them with ink. And then we'd get huge butcher paper and we would do cursive with those roll-ons. Right? And the kids loved it, and then were able to transfer that later. Now I'm realizing that that was really helpful for a lot of kids, and I will continue to incorporate my cursor. Mm -hmm. Well, you're firing up so many synapses in my head of, of, <laughs> of uh, you know, great, great educator, right? But a couple different things that she has going on in there. And with the kinesthetic, you know, I mean, Anna Gillingham was doing this back in the 1920s on the roof of the thing, B and A and C. But my friend Diana King, who's in the film, uh, we're, we're doing a new film with her, The Teachings of Diana King, which, which you can see if you go to the IDA or we're going to have online. And if you, if you sign up for the mailing list with us, and I think we're going to be changing, the, we're going to be exchanging the, the list here, you guys will be able to see it. So for parents who want to have their kids writing and shaving cream on the wall, yeah. you know, yeah. or in the, on, the, on the tables and stuff, you know, and clean up after them and all that stuff. But, but that's all helping all that, and it's kinesthetic, and it's helping there. And the thing that you said about, about cursive writing, that... It, Look, guys, I, I speak one language and I speak it poorly, right? My writing, you won't be able to read my handwriting. I'm dysgraphic, I'm dyscalculus, I'm dis, you know, I'm dysgraphic, I'm dyslexia, you name it, I'm dis. <laughs> this, this, is, this is me. So, so, but the bottom line, but I compensate, I can talk, kind of, you know? So the bottom line is, my friend Diana, who, who's founded a school, founded a camp, she's in her 80s, 
when she's, when she's talking about cursive handwriting, you also are able to get more notes faster than if you're picking up yeah. the words. And if you're trying to spell the word, forget it. Yeah. I am not the guy that you want to have as your note taker. <laughs> not me. We're good at some things, we're bad at other things, because we all learn differently. Okay. What else did you guys think about? And, you know, with science and math, you know, you got to read before you can before you can solve the problems, right? Okay, what do you got? What I what I love, Harvey. A couple of things about the movie. One is the number of people that 10 to 35, 15 to 35 million. So anywhere between five and 10 percent of the population. Um, I love that you use the word learning difference. And I, I think at the secondary level, uh, there's certainly a stigma in being different. Uh, the adolescents feel that stigma, whether you're the only person of your race in a particular class, or the only person of your religion, or your sexual orientation, or your physical appearance, or any difference, middle school and high school. Um, and the dirty little secret is we all feel different if you talk to adults. Uh, but at that moment, when you're 12, 13, 14, and you feel awkward as hell because you're sitting there and you think you're the only one. Um, so just knowing that there are so many people, and, and in the elementary, when you get kids extra help, there doesn't seem to be quite as much stigma, but quite frankly, at the secondary, to tell a kid at 16, now you have to go down to the special That's room. Uh, and, and so we have to find a way somehow, um, first to just be more accepting of human differences, um, but also to remove the stigma. And I think your movie by showing the number of people would be extremely helpful in removing that self-perceived stigma. So I, I, I hope we can find a way to share this uh, in ways far, far and wide. You know, Rich and I are both, when we yeah. talked really briefly last night, we're both high school science, advanced science. And, and I think, first off, I come from a district, it's very data driven. And, and I think now for, for us, that is so helpful because we can look back at data all the way back into their elementary grades. Not just number data, not just standardized tests, okay, but teacher observations, okay. And so I, I really hope that, that in, in, in our districts that we're, we're being able to perhaps, and I, and I know it talked about, about how expensive it is to do, to do all the, the psychomotor, all the different tests that need to be done to actually diagnose dyslexia and, and other learning differences, but it's got to be so much more helpful now that we have all this data that we can look back on. I kind of, kind of like, like Pat. I have a district that I have wonderful resources. Okay, and they'll either come in and, and work with the students one on one a little bit. Um, they they have time. They meet with them every week to discuss different strategies, and then they come to me. I just had had a, a student two years ago had dysgraphia, and they give me strategies. But I think overall in science, conceptual learning. Okay? Not the whole memorizing and things like that, but learning and understanding the concept. And I too do labs all the time. But we also act out stuff. Okay? If we want to talk about neurotransmitters and the synapses and, and things like that, then we will make human role, role models of us. And we'll get up there and we'll do it step by step by step. So I think the learning by doing, okay? I think the conceptual learning to just totally understand the concept of it. I, like Ben, I don't really use a textbook. It's there as a resource. It's given to me by the college, okay? So if they want to use it, they, they, they can. But I also think that the data now is allowing us to really look hard. When I get my 140 kids every year, first thing I do is I spend about four or five hours and I look back. I have, at the touch of a button, I have all their data all the way back to first grade and all the different observations, okay? And I get to know my kids that way. And you're, and you're doing that with what Dr. Pat said. You're able to go back and say, okay, where did the break happen here? And why did they say this is uh, this kid was a happy learner doing all this stuff in first grade? Not so much here. What's the break that happens in there? And one of the things that you touched on in the multi-sensory, you know, so I also, you know, so I lived pretty close. We didn't have a lot of money when we made the film, so we, I live, luckily I live close enough to a little town uh, called Yale, New Haven, so I can go get a bunch of neuroscientists down there. They're kind of waiting for me, like all the time. I can always just go down there and ask them, because just because I'm dyslexic doesn't mean I know nothing about no dyslexia. I just keep asking them all about the same questions, right? I just keep asking them. So Ken Pugh, the, the scientist, says, um, hey, Harvey, you know, see, I believe in multisensory, just like what you guys are, what the educators are talking about, what they do. These are the top educators, and, and you're going to hear that they're, they're not just talking to their kids, they're getting them involved, right? And so where we came from as a species is that we learned to, 
fix a wagon wheel, make chicken soup, make a, make a quilt by hanging out with our family, our aunts, our uncles, our moms, our dads, you know, and you're, you're working multi-sensory if you have to. Um, everybody's gonna make chicken soup a little bit different. Your aunt's gonna do it different than your grandmother than your sister. But then eventually when they're gone, you're gonna be passing it on. So multi-sensory is the way humans learn. Ken Pugh told me, hey, Harvey, like they just did this great study, yeah, and they have proof that humans learn best by multi-sensory. I'm like, Ken, are you eggheads? Are we give how much money to these uh, scientists? You know, I mean, I could have had some of that money on our film. You know, and it's like you eggheads took all that stuff to to figure out what we already knew by just listening to our grandparents and our great grandparents, right? And he says, Yeah, Harvey, but now we have proof. So we have proof of what's going on all the time. All right, okay. So what do you guys? Yeah. There's so much self-affirmation here. Uh, uh, thankfully, uh, and self-realization too. I've taught 20 some years of science, fourth and fifth grade. Also teach at the jail prison system. I'll get to that in a second, maybe. We literally, I, I've been lambasted by superiors by, for not using textbooks or any kind of a book. We do nature hikes. We do. Uh, experimentation, we do, we do the scientific method and I tell stories. And that's the way we learn, they blow the lid off you know, their science tests and it reaches all learners. I didn't realize, you know, it was connected to scientific data like this, I just did it in the future right here. Um, I also realize, I don't, I don't know, maybe jumping way ahead, you know, I never did like public school. Uh, I didn't realize until I went back to become a teacher at 32, I always felt I wasn't smart, and that's, I had this wonderful professor who's, who said, yeah, you already got me to take an IQ test. I qualify for American Mensa easily. But I never knew that. I, I have a hard time speaking. I, I have these words up here, and I can write books I've written for, but I never read one. I haven't read one in so, <laughs> so long. Uh, and anyway, I, I relate to this stuff in more ways than I might have realized. And teaching it to jail, I've taught almost 3,000 jail inmates, more than I have children, over 2,000 children. And I think why I like it and enjoy it so much is because I can get in their head. And a lot of what this lady does, uh, the one that was like 80, wonderful, started to school in 69, I forget mm -hmm. the name, but breaking down phonetically, and, and we'll do visual images, you know. I think the 70%.